Well, good morning. We come to Acts chapter 4. If you remember in these Facebook devotions, these Facebook Live short video devotions, on Monday we began to walk through the book of Acts. It's hard to keep them short when going through the book of Acts. Uh, for one reason, uh, Acts, the chapters are long, longer on some of these chapters. Uh, two, there's not as easy, um, the, the stopping points are, are not as easy because it's more narrative and it's harder to stop at a good point in narrative as opposed to in maybe doctrinal writing and things like that. We're going to try to do Acts chapter 4 today. Remember, Acts is written by uh, Dr. Luke, Luke the beloved physician. Luke, who we know by his vocabulary, wrote in a little bit more scholarly uh, way, more specific terminology and things like that. It's called the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And yesterday, we saw Peter and John preach the gospel after, after healing a blind beggar. And here we come to Acts chapter 4, and Peter and John are arrested. Let me begin reading with a few comments in between. As they were speaking to the people, remember Peter's preaching, he's preaching a message. As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them. So these are religious leaders, religious authorities, they came up to them. Being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. The leaders were disturbed because Peter and John were proclaiming the resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. That's one difference between them and the Pharisees, which were two of the three or four religious groups in Israel during the time. So Sadducees didn't even believe in the resurrection. They were not happy about this. Verse 3 it says, and they, which is the Sadducees and these, these leaders, and they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. So it's the evening, they put them in jail. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. 5,000 believed. Now just in, the, in Acts chapter 2, it was like 3,000 believed. Now that's about, it says about 3,000. So it could have been more. Oftentimes they didn't count women and children. Here's 5,000. This church is growing, and it is growing fast. And the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. So now you got the rulers, the elders, the scribes. The scribes are the people who copied the manuscripts, and it's a very authoritative leadership position during that day. They gathered together in verse 6. And Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. Notice Luke gives great detail. This is one of the proofs of this as a historical document because he's placing names in this document, in the book of Acts. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Now they're putting James and John, I mean Peter and John, right there in the center, interrogating interrogating them. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, notice how it says that, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, in the Gospels, Jesus said, don't worry when you're called before the rulers and authorities. Don't worry about what you're going to say. For Jesus said that he will speak through them. He speaks through the Holy Spirit. So Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. Now, that's quite a testimony. I mean, this man was crippled from his mother's womb, crippled from birth as a beggar. And he stood up and instantaneously was praising God, walking, leaping, jumping, all kinds of stuff. It's quite a testimony. So Peter's kind of saying, if that's why you have me here, it's because of Jesus. Verse 11. About Jesus, Peter says, He is a stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. Now, that's an Old Testament quote from Psalm 118.22. Psalm 118.22. That's a quote from there. Um, it's used again in Mark 9.22. Is that? No, Mark 9.12 as well. But he's saying, The stone which was rejected by you, which would be Jesus, became the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone is very important in that day in building. And there is salvation, Peter continues, And there is salvation in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. You can only be saved by Jesus. Verse 13. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Here's Peter and John, uneducated, untrained men. They had great confidence. They're just amazed by them. Verse 14. And seeing the man, and, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. I mean, how do you argue with this? This man... Everybody knew he was always lame. He's been healed. What do you do? How do you respond? 
Verse 15, but when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another. So they have Peter and John leave the council and they start to, to meet without them. Verse 16, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. They cannot deny the miracle. Verse 17, But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. Okay, so they're going to warn them. Verse 18, And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. No more. But Peter and John answered and said to them this. Listen to this. This is important. Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. They're saying we cannot speak and cannot keep giving testimony about what they have seen and heard with Jesus. Now, that's a, this is an important truth in, in the Bible and for the Christian today. We are to submit to authorities until they contradict God as the ultimate authority. If our, if our local authorities contradict God... And what he teaches us to do, we obey God. God is the higher power. He's the greatest power. Omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. He's the greatest power. He's the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. If there's a contradiction between what he says and what the uh, local leaders say, we obey God. We obey God. Verse 21. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. All the people are glorifying God. This lame man has been, has been healed. So they threatened them. They let him go. Verse 22. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Now get that. This man was over 40 years old. For 40 years he was, he was lame and he has been healed. Verse 23. When they had been released, they went on. They went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. This is the first persecution that we really see, by the way. Verse 24. And when they had heard this, now, now they went to talk to all the other apostles. So now it says, and when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. Now, not a Honda accord. <laughs> it means in union. They lifted their voices together, all together in great unity. And said, this is an awesome prayer. This is their prayer. They've been persecuted and this is how they respond. They said, oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Notice their prayer begins with worship. They're worshiping the Lord as the creator of everything. Verse 25, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, why did the Gentiles rage and the people devise futile, futile means worthless things. The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. That's an Old Testament quote from Psalm 2.1. Psalm 2.1. In Psalm 2.2. Verse 27. They're continuing. This is a prayer. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of earth. They're continuing to pray. And they're just saying, in this city, they were gathered together, all these people. And so verse 28. To do, this gathering continues, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. This prayer is very much about the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. He was in control and they're giving, they're worshiping the Lord by recognizing his great sovereignty. Verse 29. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. Grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. So in their prayer, they begin their prayer with great worship, recognizing the Lord is sovereign and in control. Now in their prayer, they say that they are bond servants. It's kind of like a willing servant. It means something to the effect of an indentured servant. And they're praying that they can continue to speak the Lord's word with all confidence. Now, in this case, the Lord's word is likely the gospel. They're praying that in persecution, which they're going to face a lot more persecution, they can speak the Lord's word with great confidence. Now, this is the first persecution in the book of Acts. We know that soon after, in a few chapters, Acts chapter 12, uh, James is... is um, is killed by Herod. In Acts chapter 8, Stephen is stoned to death. We know that later on, Paul is in prison. We know that all the apostles face persecution, most and maybe all martyrdom. John, they tried to kill, John the apostle, but he just wouldn't die, so they exiled him to the island Patmos. Uh, Paul the apostle later was beheaded. Legend has it that milk came out of his neck when he was beheaded as the mother of the church. I don't really believe that. Peter was crucified upside down after watching his wife be crucified. He said he would be crucified upside down because he was not worthy to be crucified the way of Jesus. Okay, so here they're praying after persecution. Not that the persecution stops. 
They just pray, consider your threats, consider their threats, not your threats, consider their threats and allow us to speak the word with confidence. Verse 30, and the prayer continues, while you, you is talking about God, while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus, the signs and wonders take place through Jesus. And they're, they're, they're talking about the Lord continuing these signs and wonders. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So God is already answering their prayer. They're, allowed to, they're able to speak God's word, God's gospel with boldness. Now verses 32 through 37. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart. Now that's really nice, just to have unity there. One heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. Now, people look at some of these passages in the book of Acts, and they start to jump to socialism and things like that. This really isn't socialism. This is willing participation. They are willingly sacrificing for one another. And it seems as though here, as well as Acts chapter 2, it's, it, it's maybe not one incident, like this was one day or one week, but it's talking about the church over a few years. It's talking about the ideal church. They had great unity and they're sacrificing for one another. Verse 33, and with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. So they're giving testimony. God is answering their prayer. For there was not a needy person among them for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. So they're sacrificing for one another. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned attractively and sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now this is introducing Barnabas. We're going to see a lot more about Barnabas in, in, in this book of Acts. Later on, Barnabas goes on the first missionary journey with the apostle Paul. Him and um, Paul have a dispute over John Mark later on, yet they do reconcile. But we're going to see much more about Barnabas. So that's Acts chapter 4 today. We'll begin Acts chapter 5 probably in a week and a half. I'm on vacation next week and uh, going to Disney World with the family. So that's a little going to be a little complicated to do some of these. So have a great night, a great day, and the Lord. God bless.